Welcome everyone to our uh, session today with Heather McKenzie and Tony Desario. We're delighted to have them with us. And they're going to be talking with us today about formative and summative assessment. So uh, Heather, we're glad to have you and Tony. I know you guys are there in the same room and ready to go. Uh, just jump in, share a little bit with us about who you are, who you guys are, and then uh, let us know about formative and summative assessment. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. And it's so nice to see so many folks with us. Um, so we'll jump right in as Pam shared. Um, my name is Heather and I'm going to introduce my colleague, Tony. So Tony, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, hey. hi everybody. I'm Tony Desario. I am, if you're looking at that picture, the crazy Google-eyed guy there on the left. My partner and boss and good friend is sitting or standing right next to me there. That's Heather McKenzie. Uh, I'm an elementary social studies teacher on special assignment for Henry County Schools. That sort of is equivalent to a district level coach. I support 26 elementary schools and assist in supporting our other uh, 25 secondary schools. I've been teaching for about 20 years. I'm um, certified pre-K through eighth grade in all content areas, and I happen to be lucky enough to win a 2017 Outstanding Educator Award. That's me. Whew. All right, so that's a tough one to follow. Um, and so, yeah, I'm the one in the dress next to Tony. Okay, hold on. We just got a note from Aaron that said maybe launch the whole PowerPoint so we can see the screen. So we're going to fix our display settings very quickly. Is that better? Can I get a thumbs up, thumbs down if that's better? See what I did there? All right. So back to the fun intros. So yeah, I'm the one with the googly eyes and the dress, and my name is Heather McKenzie, and I am fortunate enough to serve um, Henry County Schools as the instructional coordinator for K-12 social studies. And just a little bit about Henry County is we are located in Georgia, about 25 minutes south um, of the Atlanta airport, and we are the eighth largest district in the state of Georgia. We have about 42,000 students, 50 schools, and, and several programs. Um, before assuming this position four years ago, I was a classroom teacher for 13 years. And so I started out as um, an elementary K-6 special ed teacher, moved into elementary fifth grade, taught middle grades, ELA and social studies. And although I was cert I am certified um, high school history, I, I never quite made it there because I got my dream job. Um, I also had a really good year, as did Tony. And so I was very lucky, and this year was named the Social Studies Supervisor of the Year for the state of Georgia and uh, elected president-elect for the Georgia Council for the Social Studies. So I say all that to say that Tony and I really, really love social studies, and that's why we are really excited to spend some time with you all today talking about formative and summative assessments. And so to that end, I wanted to share today's learning targets. And so our learning targets, as you can see, are written in I can form and ideally are going to be in student-friendly, y'all being the students, uh, language. So Tony, you wanna to talk a little bit about our learning targets and, and share them with our friends. So can't do a formative or summative assessment webinar without having our learning targets and our I can statements. Hopefully when you're finished today, you'll be able to say I can, explain the difference between formative and summative assessments. You'll be able to say that you can use formative assessments to support student learning, you can create student-friendly learning targets and you can duplicate the process of creating learning targets in your own classroom, school, or system. So those are our learning targets for today. So let's move into assessments. And I want you all to do me a favor and for a quick second, envision what if assessment had a face? What do you think it would look like? Do I have a volunteer who would like to speak up and share what that face might look like or type that into the chat? A, mon <laughs> monster. a monster dreaded oh, some of these responses are dreaded. really good okay frowny frowny face okay so might they look like this and so the sad fact is that unfortunately yes. when we think <laughs> of parents and students and teachers and other stakeholders we often see a lot of these faces when we're talking about assessment and so what we want to do today is, is break down the different types of assessments to see if we can begin to kind of shift this perception of assessment, if you will. 
So we wanted to take a look at where we've come from and where we're going. So how do we measure student learning? Traditionally, we know that most or all of our assignments um, were graded. As a student, I really didn't understand the difference between quizzes and tests because again, both were graded. Uh, quizzes typically seem shorter than the one test that we normally had at the end of the unit. I recall very lengthy independent projects and few opportunities for retest. And let me say that this wasn't just as a student, but I think I've been guilty of some of these practices even as a teacher. So the traditional goals were uh, either you knew it or you didn't know it. And the goal was not for you to know it. It was just to assess you. And as we move into today, we've sort of started to look at more of a progress monitoring situation. So we set learning targets and targeted remediation. We have performance tasks, item analysis, but the key word there is working for mastery. So we want students to know what they're supposed to know and we keep giving opportunities until they have demonstrated mastery. So that's going to lead us right into what is formative assessment. And so I wanted to cite a little bit of research because what are we if we are not educators who look at the research? And many of you may be familiar with this book, um, Understanding by Design from Wiggins and McTighe from 2005. It's had many editions that come out. We call it UBD around <laughs> these parts. <laughs> um, but within this book, these authors really called for an assessment overhaul, um, a deviation from what we all saw as the traditional assessment methods and they emphasized the importance of planning instruction and assessment around the desired understanding a little bit of a backward design model but we wanted to being social studies teachers provide multiple sources so to that end we also looked up some information on formative assessment from susan brookhart um, who released this book in 2010 formative assessment strategies for every classroom and what Susan has said is that formative assessment refers to the ongoing process students and teachers engage in when they, one, focus on learning goals, two, take stock of where current work is in relation to the goal, and three, take action to move closer to the goal. What I want you to really focus on in this one is the word ongoing. So whereas Tony was referencing that it used to be a one and done, you either got it or you don't, this is something that is ongoing. And that leads perfectly into these three big questions that have been used and translated across formative and summative assessment uh, horizons. And so these are the big questions. We want students to be able to ask this question, where am I going? We want students to say, how am I going or how am I going to get there and where to next? Okay. And so if we're going to break it down to a little bit of real talk, then here it is in the simplest of forms. Um, a formative assessment, y'all, is an informal assessment or a form of data collection that's going to help teachers plan instruction and help the students understand their learning needs and goals. And so when do you formatively assess? So it's interesting because what we know when we work with sometimes with teachers is that they are inundated, sometimes with county initiatives, with making sure that they are meeting all of the needs of the students because that is the heart focus, everything that we do. What we don't want our friends that are joining us today is to see formative assessments as one more thing. So when do you formatively assess? Well, you do it when you conduct observations, observations of your peers, um, observations of your students. You're doing it when you're questioning, providing assignments, anytime you're handing out quizzes, or even through classroom discussion, you are taking the pulse of your classroom. So let's talk a little bit more about formative versus summative assessment with a little side-by-side -side comparison. So here's what we know about formative assessments. They can be used before. Using a formative assessment before is going to help you understand where your students currently are. What is their baseline? What general understanding are they walking in with, which will allow you to work with your students to set goals and really set those learning targets. By using them during your instruction, it allows you to see where are they, how much have they grown from that starting point, and what do they still have yet to learn to get to the end point. And summative is used afterward. It's used after the instruction to prove that they have learned or mastered. And the thing that's interesting about summative assessment, especially here in Henry County, is that the lines between summative and formative can be blurred 
If we're using summative after and our students are not showing mastery, it then becomes formative and leads into further instruction. So again, echoing what Tony just said, when we're looking at formative assessments, the objective is to learn for mastery. They can be used to inform your instruction as a teacher and help the students what they know and what they have yet to learn. Summative is that opportunity for students to demonstrate achievement, for the teachers to evaluate student learning at the end, and can sometimes be associated with high stakes testing. But going back to the left side of your screen, as Tony mentioned, summative can be used formatively if you see the students haven't um, measured that yet. When we think of formative, we think of no grades, because again, this is ongoing. The end game is for students to demonstrate mastery. Summative typically comes at the end of the unit. So we've talked about their comparisons, but I think it's important that you understand that they have one very strong connecting line. Dun, dun, dun. And that is both formative and summative assessments serve the same learning target. And so most of us that are here today are probably social studies teachers. So I want to take a moment to dive a little bit more deeply into what formative assessment in the social studies looks like. So Dr. Lee from North Carolina State has done some work for the C3 framework. Tony, can you tell us anything about the C3 framework? Where is it from? <laughs> well, so it's the it's from that IDM and C3 inquiry arc. It's it's published nationally. It's done by our friends at uh, NCSS, and it is going to guide all of the work for inquiry that we do here in our county and uh, across the country. So perfect. So since we are talking about inquiry and that is a basis for social studies which let's be honest guys that has always been the purpose of social studies long before inquiry became a very popular or hot buzzword and so here's what dr lee says that in order to make a coherent and evidence-based argument students need practice with argumentation skills so when i think practice i think ongoing i think multiple opportunities a formative task that kind of work is purposeful as there's no gotcha summative assessment. So again, going back to what Tony said with the, you either got it or you don't, this isn't that opportunity where it's like, oops, look, look what you know, look what you don't know, and this is it. And finally, these formative tasks are framed by supporting or scaffolding questions, which is just best practice and things that most of you are already probably doing, but may not explicitly be calling it formative assessment in social studies. So as, as we start to look at the IBM model and the C3 inquiry arc, we can see the formative tasks are extremely important. If we look there, we're looking for the sweet spot. The sweet spot is where those formative tasks, where we focus on those content and skills, are going to happen when students answer in the form of a summative argument. That's going to be our summative assessment head. So practically, what that looks like is think about when you are looking at primary sources. You begin with sort of those compelling or driving or overarching questions, and you have a lot of those scaffolding questions that really chunk out the content, the little skills for you. But then in the end, if you were to say, take a DBQ and see it through to the end, that DBQ, that essay, that answering of the compelling question, that's your summative, but you would have struggled to be as successful in that summative had you not had those sort of um, checkpoints in place through your formative tasks. And we might talk about this again a little bit later, but it's important to understand that this idea of, oh, my students never do well on my tests is something that really shouldn't happen. If, our, if we're making sure that we're formatively assessing students before we get to our summative argument, our summative task, we'll know that they're ready and, and able to be successful on any summative assessment that we give them. This slide is a little bit misleading because when you see step one, that almost indicates that there's going to be multiple steps. And the truth is, of course there are. There's always multiple steps when you are designing assessments, but we're not gonna outline all of those steps today. Um, what we're going to do right now is focus specifically on those learning targets. And so why? Why would we begin with the learning targets? Well, one, because you always want to begin with the why. You want to begin with the why, you want to talk about the how, and then you want to talk about what that looks like. But the why learning targets, because if you think back to what we shared just a few moments ago, those learning targets are what, that is the common thread through all assessments, be it formative or summative. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that, because for you all who may not yet be comfortable or are just dipping your 
your toe in the pool of playing with assessments and trying formative assessments, it's a great jumping off point. So we're going to talk about learning targets, allowing students to answer three questions. And Tony, what are those questions? The big question, where am I now? The next one is where am I going? And of course, how can I close the gap or how can I get there? And these three questions are questions that students are to ask of themselves and be able to answer with teacher support. And so there are benefits of very, very clear learning targets. And so here you can see we've broken it down for three types of stakeholders. The benefits of clear learning targets for teachers, for students, and for parents. And so let's begin with a little backward design here and begin with the parents because sometimes you have difficulty communicating with parents because how many of you have sat in a parent conference where a parent says, well, when I was in school, I was tested this way or I had this textbook and this is how I learned. Um, and it's sometimes difficult to explain something um, in a way that makes them feel very comfortable and in a way where they can feel that their student is truly receiving the support that, that we know is being provided. A lot of times we talk about parent conferences when parents are confused about what that 83% means. What does 83% mean? What do they know 83% of? What's the 17% that they don't know? The difference is with clear learning targets, parents know exactly what a student is supposed to know, what they don't know, and then the teacher can clarify those steps that the teacher and students are taking together to close the gap. Love that. So for teachers, it's shifting the focus from what the teachers are teaching to what the students are actually learning. I share this with my teachers a lot, that I recall my very first day of teaching middle school and I walk into pre-planning and I sit in a meeting and you all know exactly what meeting I'm talking about. And I had an assistant principal and he was talking about preparing for the year. And he made a comment and he said, the bottom line is, if the students aren't learning, you aren't teaching. And I'll be honest, guys, I had to check my ego because that kind of ruffled me in a little bit because I was thinking about all of the time that I had spent preparing lessons and, and fine tuning what I felt to be really good assessment instruments. But when I put that ego aside and really thought about it and realized, you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to student mastery. It comes down to how do I know what the students know? And if I can't answer that, then whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm planning, however much I may be standing up there and speaking ad nauseum, really, really doesn't work. And so I loved the idea of the focus being placed in that instance. It really, really does drive it back home to the students and what they're doing. The great thing about shifting focus from what teachers are teaching to what students are learning is that as I do observations across the uh, our county and across the state, I still see a lot of teachers as the sage on the stage. They are the goddesses and gods of information and all learning must go through them. And they are exhausted. They struggle getting through their days and they can't figure out why their students struggle on their assessments because they're doing such a good job of leading all learning. The great thing about this about formative assessment and clear learning targets is it shifts the bulk of the work, the weight of the work back to the students where it belongs and we call that student-centered learning. And so then let's end with the students um, on this slide and here's what I love. We talk a lot about student ownership but have you ever walked into a classroom and said to a student what are you learning and they say social studies and that's the beginning and end of what they can communicate to you or ask them well why are you learning this? What will you do with this information? I want you to imagine how powerful it will be when the students are able to see what their targets are, articulate that, and the pride that they will feel when they hit targets that they can see, um, that they're able to focus on that specific learning target and not necessarily get distracted by the big picture, and that what we are doing is we are modeling and helping them become very reflective thinkers, which we know is a skill that is applicable not just to social studies, but to life in general. And so we talk about the benefits of learning target, but did you know that there are learning target types? How many are there, Heather? There are four <laughs> learning target types. That's great. So let's kind of go through, and we're going to do a quick review of this, and then there's going to be a pop quiz, y'all. This is my little formative check-in after this. So I'm going to begin with knowledge targets. Now, knowledge targets represent the factual information, procedural knowledge, conceptual understandings that underpin each discipline. That's basic stuff, right? 
it's basic stuff. But, you know, one thing that I want to warn everybody against is that sometimes there's a, a, a misconception that when we look at these and there are four, and especially for anybody who might be thinking depth of knowledge, it's important that we don't assume that this is 100% aligned with Webb's DOK and that all knowledge is DOK one, all reasoning two, all skills three, and so on and so forth. Because ultimately, as we know, that is dependent upon student product. But when we're talking about learning target types, yes, knowledge targets are sort of those foundational, those content informations that are necessary. But tell us about reasoning targets, Tony. You know what? These are ones we use a lot in social studies. We use these and those skill targets pretty often. They are, reasoning targets are um, those targets that specify the thought processes students are to learn to do well within a range of subjects. We've got a bunch of them in social studies. How about skill targets, Heather? Skills are those in which a demonstration or a physical skill-based performance is at the heart of learning. So I can tell you in our county, um, our athletic director and health and PE coordinator has eaten this up in terms of developing some skill targets for his teachers so that students can see that they have got learning targets across all content areas. And in social studies, we want students to have the skill set required to analyze primary sources, secondary sources, and tertiary sources to be able to come to conclusions on their own. But the big one are those product targets. What are those? So product targets describe learning in terms of artifacts in which creation of a product is the focus of a learning target. With product targets, the specification, specifications for quality for the product itself are the focus of teaching and assessment. So take a quick moment to take a look at this. Knowledge, reasoning, skills, and product targets. And then I want to ask you all a quick question. Do you feel like you got it? Are we feeling good? You know what the good news is? Even if you don't, you'll have the opportunity to review this and retest later. And we can't hear you, so it works out perfect. <laughs> so let's move on to a sample learning target for social studies. So it says, I can explain how the different regions of an area of study affect one another in terms of physical features and political boundaries. Is there anyone who wants to take a stab as to whether or not that is knowledge, reasoning, skill, or product? They're all typing at once, Heather. We just can't, they can't are. see it. They are. But luckily for us, we were teachers for a really long time, and we possess excellent wait time. Yes, we do. And we have lots to do, because we're in the same room together, so we can play phone games while you all type in your response. What kind of learning target is it? And we don't judge if you're currently Googling. <laughs> all right. They got it right, Heather. They got it right. They did. It was reasoning. It was reasoning. Yes. You got it. Everybody pat yourself on the back. Two air. Okay. Of course, Dr. Com Willis. Dr. Willis comes in at the wire with two, and he is yeah. absolutely correct. Fingers hot on the keyboard to answer this. The sample learning tar target, I can use a variety of geographic tools such as maps, globes, graphs, and charts. So give me those answers. Perform <laughs> oh, wow, John. John for the win. John, Thank you. Yeah. Yes, it is the performance skills. But I put this up here as a little bit of a trick and a very quick discussion point for Tony and I because this is no Dr. Willis stand by because I'm going to tell you why. This is a, is, a, is a conversation that we have had over and over, over again. Over and over again. And over again. And I think that that is because as educators, we can really justify anything and find value and alignment in any of those four learning targets. So right now, Dr. Willis is writing an email to justify why this is a one. Absolutely. So we, we <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and so, but at the end of the day, here is my take, and I cannot put this on anybody else, but I, Heather McKenzie, my will, take is right along with will, you. I'll own, take the blame. will own this belief. At the end of the day, I care more that my students can identify their learning targets, know what they need to do to meet them, and then be able to demonstrate how they can show that they've mastered that learning target. I care about that more than whether or not they can clearly align it with performance or reasoning or knowledge. So that's just my opinion. But I say that because as you are beginning to play around learning targets, I don't want you getting sort of stuck in the weeds with that, so to speak. You could spend a lot of time debating. We could debate this one uh, for a long time, actually, and we would gain no ground. The idea here, and Heather's trying to get this across to everyone, is that we need the learning target, 
really knowing whether it's knowledge, reasoning, skill, or performance ends up not being as important uh, in our daily work where the rubber meets the road. Absolutely. So that brings us to how do you create, how do you use, how do you benefit from learning targets, formative assessments, and so on. And so here's what I do know. Overall research has shown that when formative assessments are commonly practiced and provided by teachers and students actively participate, students achieve, and students are motivated. So in our final minutes with you, we want to move on and talk about what could this look like in your classroom? And so Tony, talk to us about what this could look like in their classroom. Here are three quick samples, and we're running low on time, so we're gonna just kind of rush through these a little bit here. Just three quick samples of what you might use for formative assessment opportunities in your room. In that left-hand corner, we see journal entries. This is actually paraphrasing a quote. So if we wanna make sure that we understand that our students understand and we know that our students understand what a quote means, we can ask them to paraphrase. Down below we have that sensory figure. That sensory figure is letting us know what they think a, an historical character might be thinking, feeling, seeing, etc. And those ABC boxes on the right, is that's a quick assessment tool alphabetically to find out what they might know about a topic. So give us something, let's say, about pioneer life that starts with an A, a B, a C, a D, et cetera. That gives us a quick insight into what students already know and so that we can make sure they're ready for those summative assessments that come later. And so if we're talking about formative assessments or using that formatively, if you used it beforehand and perhaps the students could only fill in five letters, but then you did a check midway through your unit to see what could you add to that and see how many more can they fill? What would they change? That's a way that you can use this formatively before and during. What are some other ways that they can use this in their classroom? So if you're learning about Malcolm X and Martin uh, Luther King Jr. or Eisenhower and Truman or any of our historical figures throughout our time period, we might want to know what they would say. And by having kids very quickly write something that they would say, we can definitely align that to whatever our learning targets might be to figure out and make sure that they know what their learning is supposed to be. And we can ask them to compare and contrast those using Venn diagrams. We can ask them to do those in small groups or individually, and then we know for sure if they're ready to move on to our summative assessments. So the right there, we have our text-dependent questions that are integrated and fall into the categories of key ideas and details, craft and structure and integration of knowledge and ideas, and those based on the student responses can give us great information about whether or not the students are ready to work summatively. So let's talk a little bit about questioning. Uh, it's really our questions that drive everything that we do in social studies, but also in all topics. And uh, just a couple little tidbits here. This comes from math, the math land, and it says, and with that, they were good to go with little to no explanation. Too often, we'll tell students what to do and how to do it, and then expect them to genuinely engage in some authentic task. That's Graham Fletcher, uh, the three-act task guy, who's actually from our county, if you follow him, gfletchy.com. He's a math guru, and what I love about what he just said is that if we're talking about inquiry in the arc, we're really trying to give students an opportunity to do history on their own. And in order to do history, we've got to have great questioning. So one way that we've attacked that, especially uh, when we're dealing with primary sources in a very quick and formative way is to ask students to begin to analyze using these three questions. What do you see or notice? What do you know or think you know? And what are you curious about? And so questioning can be external, but it can also be intrinsic as well. And so sometimes good questioning is what leads our students to become reflective thinkers. So here is just a little quick list of things that you can use with students to model even think aloud for the students as you're learning through something or grappling with a topic. And that is, well, what is my learning target? What resources do I need to meet this target? And what resources do I have access to? What do I already know? What do I still need to work on? And how can I show mastery? And that is, and that is so powerful because according to Marzano, students who I can identify what they are learning significantly outscore those who cannot. And so I say all of that to say this, I know that in the age of accountability, we sometimes struggle to think outside of the box or we feel the pressure and the need to get content and test prep. But 
this this research is very powerful and again one of the things that you just can't really put a price on is by assessing students formatively and checking in with them and helping them to identify learning targets you are increasing their confidence and their ability to become lifelong learners and in order to be lifelong learners students students need to learn how to learn and this is that big idea when students have learning targets that they're able to know understand and able to verbalize them they're going to learn how to learn that's the big idea and here's why because ultimately all students will think independently and critically with limited assistance and that is hashtag goals if i have ever seen it self-assessment will lead to that independent learning and so your homework as we prepare to leave you all is to do a little reflective thinking yourself so for those of you who have access to, to resources from socialstudies.com, how are you using that to support best assessment practice in your own building? And so that brings us to our near conclusion. And so I want to ask, are there any questions from our audience at this time that we may not have gotten to? This one's not a quiz. Just any yeah. questions that you might have. <laughs> I'm a Taurus. I like long walks on the beach. Is anyone asking that? No? All right. <laughs> Will we come back? For the next one, yes, which is in like 10 or 15 minutes, I think. Is that right? <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> Any other questions? Can we get a copy of the PowerPoint? Um, what I will do is, I don't have anybody's registration information, but Pam, I'm happy to share it with you. And if you have access to that, then you can push that out um, as you need to, but I'm happy to share that. I do have that. That would be great. I'm sure that they would love that. Also, we okay. have recorded the session today, so it will be posted and I will email you guys tomorrow with the link to the posting. But Heather, honestly, you and Tony are fabulous. You have done such a great job today. And this was not boring. You kept my attention the entire time. I was really very engaged with this. Thank you so much. And I see some of our participants thanking you also. This has just been a tremendous, tremendous webinar today. Heather and Tony are creating uh, a blog article and that will be showing up very soon at blog.socialstudies.com. Okay, that's and what we so said. That, that's exactly what we said. And we also just encourage everybody to reach out to you, Pam, um, because as we mentioned, we, we can't say enough about the responsiveness of socialstudies.com and their willingness to assist teachers. So for anybody who needs that, please take advantage of that. And thank you so much for sharing your time with us. And thank you, um, Pam and Dr. Willis, for allowing us to do this today. Great thank fun. You. Thanks, all. Thank you guys so much. Really great job. We enjoyed it so much. Everybody that was participating today, thank you for joining us. We were delighted to have you. And you'll get an email tomorrow with the link for today's webinar. Please share it with all of your colleagues and friends. Uh, for now, we're going to say good night, good afternoon, depending on where you are. And we hope to have you for another webinar in the near future. Thanks again, all.